Time travel. One of mankind's oldest fantasies. But is it possible? Who of us has not wondered what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen next? Or thought about the past? Maybe to visit some significant historical event or maybe to change something in our lives. But is it really a possibility? I'm going to answer that question for you. But first, what I want to do is to share with you a little bit about why I became fascinated with the whole concept of time travel. I was the oldest of four children, and I grew up in the Bronx. My father was a radio and television repairman, and he was, uh, to me, the center of my universe. The thing is, is that he seemed like he was very healthy and very robust. We didn't know, perhaps my mother knew, I think she did, that he had a very weak heart. And he died of a massive heart attack when he was only 33 years old. And I was 10. And it brought my universe to an end. I mean, it crushed me. And I went through, after his funeral, to me, I didn't care whether I lived or died. He left me with very many gifts, and one of the gifts he left me with was a love for reading, and I loved reading science fiction. And about a year after he died, when I was about 11, I came across the book that changed my life. It was The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. The thing is, is that I thought, this is it. This is the answer. If I could build a time machine, then I could go back and see him again and maybe save his life. Now, what I had originally saw was a classic illustrated version. This is a, sort of a, almost like a comic version of the time machine. But in it, at the very beginning, it said that scientific people know very well that time is a kind of space, and we can move forward and backward in time just as we can in space. The thing is, is that as a child, what I tried to do, and I remember that I was around 11, I tried to put together my old father's, my father's uh, television parts and radio parts, to make, and bicycle parts, everything to try to make what I thought would be a time machine. Of course, it didn't work. But I remembered that it said that scientific people know very well. So I thought that the science was going to be important in this, but I wasn't exactly sure in what way. Incidentally, it became an obsession with me. But the thing is, is that even at the age of 11, I was astute enough to realize that I probably should not tell anyone that I wanted to build a time machine because they were already worried about me, and it might not lead to good consequences. Fortunately for me, a couple of years later, when I was about 12 or 13, I came across the second book that changed my life. It was called The Universe and Dr. Einstein. And in it, it said that Einstein, as opposed to Newton, according to Newton, time cannot be changed by anything. But according to Einstein, time can be altered, so I knew that if I could understand what Einstein said, then that might be the possibility of building a time machine. So Einstein became my second obsession. Now, the thing is, is that I, the book was only a popularization, and it was very difficult for me to understand everything that was in it, but I got the general gist of it. And eventually, I'm just sort of fast forwarding, I eventually went to college because I knew I was going to have to get an education in science. I should mention that it wasn't as simple as it sounds, because after my father passed away, we plunged into poverty. And college was not something that was automatically in my future. So I went into the service. This was during the Vietnam War period. And that's when I was able to get the money. I used the GI Bill in order to go to Penn State to get my degrees in, in physics. The thing is, is that I did not tell anyone as I was going through my career, that I was interested in building a time machine. And even when I came here as a faculty member, I did not tell people at the University of Connecticut that I was interested in building a time machine. If I had, I wouldn't be standing here and telling you about it. Okay? <laughs> the thing is, is that I used the cover story. My cover story was in terms of what are known as black holes, and I'll come to you 
back to that because that is the thing that allowed me to study how time could be affected without actually letting on that I was interested in building a time machine. The thing is, is that Einstein was the key. So the question, is time travel really possible? The answer is yes, based on the work of Albert Einstein. Einstein developed two theories. One theory was called the special theory of relativity. And in a nutshell, what that theory just simply says is that time is affected by motion. What he means by that is the fact that the faster a clock moves, the more time slows down. Time for a moving clock slows down. Now, when I talk about a clock, I'm not just talking about a mechanical mechanism. I'm talking about your heart rate, your metabolism. That, that's a clock, your heart. It slows down. This means that the faster that you move, the less you age. Okay? Now, you might say, wait a minute, has this been shown? Yes. What most people don't realize is that there was a very important experiment that was done at the Naval Observatory in 1971. What they did was to have two atomic clocks. Atomic clocks are the most precise timekeeping mechanisms we have. One atomic clock was kept at rest at the Naval Observatory. The other atomic clock was put on an ordinary passenger jet and flown around the world close to the speed of sound. When they brought the passenger jet back, they found that the clock on the passenger jet had slowed down. It actually had slowed down compared to the clock that was at rest. This meant that the scientists on board, they were, their heart rate had slowed down. This meant that they were younger than their colleagues. Now, the thing is, you might say, how come this wasn't on the front page of every newspaper around the world? It was because it was only by fractions of a second that this occurred. The effect depends on speed. So even though the plane was traveling at the speed of sound compared to the speed of light, it was very, very, very slow. The thing is, is that when we have rockets that can go close to the speed of light, we will see this dramatic effect, not just in terms of fractions of a second, but we will actually see it in terms of years. By the way, I should mention that the Large Hadron Collider, which you may have heard about, that accelerates subatomic particles, is in fact a kind of a time machine. And every time they turn that machine on, there are subatomic particles that can only normally live for fractions of a second. When they speed these particles up close to the speed of light, they find that they can actually get these particles to live 10, 20, 30 times longer than they normally would. In effect, they are sending these subatomic particles into the future. And eventually, this will happen for us. So time travel into the future is going to happen, and we've actually already seen the experimental baby steps of that. What about traveling back to the past? You can't do it with speed. No matter how fast you go, you cannot go back to the past. Does that mean we can't? No. Einstein developed a second theory. This theory came out, his first theory came out in 1905, the special theory of relativity. And as I said, in a nutshell, if someone asks you, what's the special theory of relativity? You can say, time slows down for a moving clock. His second theory was a theory of gravity. It's called the general theory of relativity. And it was developed 10 years later. Einstein said that gravity can affect time. So in a nutshell, this general theory of relativity says that time is affected by gravity. What do I mean by that? That means that a clock here at the surface of the Earth would run slower than a clock at a higher altitude, because a clock here at the surface of the Earth where gravity is stronger, that clock will run slower than one at a higher altitude. Now, you might say, has this been shown? Not only has it been shown, it's part of our everyday life. Many of you, including myself, have a device called the GPS. And what they found was is that the GPS system, when they were setting it up, wasn't working properly. Why? The reason why the GPS system works is that right now, satellites are sending a signal at a certain time that reaches the unit in your clock, in your car at a certain time. Your unit has a clock in it. When they were sending the signal, what they found is that it wasn't giving the right location. What they found out was, when they consulted with the physicists about it, is that the clock in your unit is actually running slower than the clock on board the satellites. They have to actually use computers to calibrate to take that difference into account. So we actually do know that time is affected by gravity. And it turns out that that was the key in my work. Because one of the things that's part of Einstein's theory is the fact that 
Not only can matter create gravity, we know that the Earth creates gravity, pulls us down, the sun creates gravity that keeps us in orbit, but light can create gravity as well. Okay? That's just a part of Einstein's theory. It wasn't part of Newton's theory. And that was the key to my work, because what I realized was is that if gravity can affect time and light can create gravity, then light can affect time. In other words, you can use light to manipulate time. And what I realized was that by using light in a particular pattern, using a laser beam in a circulating pattern, you could actually twist space and time. Okay? And you could think of it in a simple way. If you had coffee in this cup and you thought about this coffee as being like empty space, and you think of the spoon or my finger as being like a circulating light beam, then what happens is, is that as you cause the coffee to swirl around, okay, the light beam causes, uh, well, my finger causes the coffee to swirl around. If you think of empty space as being like the coffee in a cup, you can use the circulating light beam to twist the empty space. In Einstein's theory, space and time are connected to each other. So if you twist space enough, then the normal line of time, and we all move along that line from the past to the present to the future, you can eventually twist time into a loop. And along that loop in time, you can go from the past to the present to the future, but you can also then eventually go from the future back to the past. So by using a circulating beam of light, you can twist space and time, and this leads to the possibility of going back into the past. Have we done that yet? No. That is something that is part of the research. I should mention that I'm a theoretical physicist. I developed the equations based on Einstein's work to show that this is a possibility, but the experiments have not been done. That's because experiments are very, very expensive. Okay? People think about the Large Hadron Collider, the whole purpose of that is just clashing beams together, but that costs about $10 billion. The work that I'm talking about, just the startup cost for it, will cost about a quarter of a million dollars. And I have an experimental colleague, his name is Chandra Chowdhury. He's a laser physicist who's interested in working with me to try to develop the concept experimentally. But we're at that particular point. I just want to um, mention that this leads to an interesting consequence. I should mention that I'm not the only person who's interested in trying to build a time machine or to see how the possibility of going back into the past. My work is based on Einstein's work, but there's also others as well. And I mentioned this work more detail when, in my book, Time Traveler, a scientist's personal mission to make time travel a reality. For example, there's Kip Thorne at uh, Caltech who talks about using wormholes to travel back into the past. There's Richard Gott at Princeton who's talking about using cosmic strings to go back into the past. These are other methods to be used, but all of the serious work is all based on Einstein's work. There's also the possibility of paradoxes. When you talk about time travel, you say, wait a minute, if I can go back into the past, maybe I could do something in the past that could really affect the future in a dramatic way. The grandfather paradox is one of those things. For example, a milder form of it is if you go back into the past and prevent your grandparents from meeting each other, then they don't have your parents, and if they don't have their parents, they don't have you, so how were you able to go back to change the past? That's called the grandfather paradox. It turns out that physics has a solution to that, and to just put it to you in a very mild form, it says that when you try to go back into the past, then you don't go into the, pack, into the past of this universe, you go back into the past of a parallel universe. This notion of parallel universes sounds like science fiction, but quantum physics leads to that possibility. So when you go back into the past, you might arrive in a parallel universe in which you can prevent your grandparents from meeting each other, but in the universe you came from, you don't. So that universe gives rise to you. So the answer would be, you can go back into the past, but the past you arrive in is not the past that you came from. Is that so? Well, only time will tell whether that is so. The main thing that I want you to realize, however, is that we will eventually be able to control time. We will be able to control our destiny, but the thing to realize is that even then, 
The only thing that any of us have is the present moment, and we must make the most of that. And we need to enjoy our journey through time. Thank you.